Kabong, a lot of a lot of people have asked over the years about how CWA and KMU came to develop this friendship relationship, really growing international solidarity between our two worker movements. Um, and I thought maybe it might be good for us to just sort of talk a little bit about our sort of first uh, solidarity experience together um, as uh, as as labor movements in both the United States and the Philippines. Uh, in 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 2016, CWA was on strike um, at Verizon Communications, uh, and it was a pretty uh, lengthy strike. And during that time, um, a lot of the call centers in the United States, the Verizon call centers, uh, the calls that normally would have been handled in those call centers, because the workers were on strike, those calls were being routed to the Philippines. Uh, and during that time, because of our sort of global labor affiliations and partnerships, CWA got calls from the labor movement in the Philippines of workers in call centers basically saying that they didn't want to be scabs. Um, they heard about workers in the U.S. being on strike and asked what is it they could do to help. Uh, and so, you know, we at CWA put together a delegation of the striking Verizon workers flew over to the Philippines uh, to meet with workers to talk about the struggle of the Verizon U.S. workers and to learn from workers in the Philippines. And you were one of those folks that met with the the, the CWA members who came over to the Philippines. Um, and so could you talk a little bit about sort of what happened when those <laughs> folks arrived on the ground in, in yeah. Manila in the Philippines and met you guys? Yeah, before anything else, uh, I'd like to thank you for, uh, you know, uh, inviting us to your office in this uh, uh, CWA, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I clearly remember what happened then because there was a uh, huge strike of uh, the very soon uh, workers' union, and uh, I uh, remember that we uh, sent a solidarity message, and it was uh, uh, that year that the formation of the uh, BPO Industrial Employees Network was young. We have helped them uh, organize. Uh, the uh, federation of call center workers and that uh, we declare that uh, we do not want to be scabs of the striking workers in the US and so uh, the uh, you, your organization sent uh, a delegation to Manila and uh, we work closely with them and uh, bien in fact i i led the demonstration in the various various Verizon offices both in the south and northern part of uh, Metro Manila. And it came to a point where uh, we, came, we went to this big office of Verizon in, in southern Manila, and we were harassed. We were uh, threatened by the security forces of Verizon, as well as police officers in the area. And our guests from uh, CWA then were in a van, and uh, they were surrounded by the SWAT team, uh, fully armed to the teeth. And uh, we did not allow the, uh, the uh, uh, police forces to really uh, you know, uh, take them out from the van. We stood our ground and we surrounded the van in order that uh, they wouldn't be, uh, our, our guests from CWA wouldn't be molested. So we went to a point where we, so we we had a dialogue with the uh, high level officers of the military and also the uh, uh, local officers of the community there and when they knew that it was KMU they said okay we will fix the we'll fix the situation so we we're able to get out of this uh, trap and uh, after that uh, the issue became an international uh, issue and so many quarters of Various uh, labor organizations uh, uh, came out with a strong uh, statement to condemn uh, both the, you know, the uh, prolonged uh, non-attention non given by the Verizon managed to the striking workers in the U.S., as well as the 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 things that uh, happened, you know, the the threat and intimidation, as well as the uh, the uh, intended bodily harm against us and the visiting officers of the CWA in Manila. So it ended a very successful campaign. 
yeah. and I I think it was the the uh, the strike had been settled in favor of uh, the workers as well as it became an international yeah. issue. Yeah. And Bien also became a very popular organization of the call center workers. Yeah. The um, one of the things that I think that people don't realize is. By those members, I think there are two good things that came out of that experience. One was, as you said, the 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 U.S. workers and the Filipino workers, uh, uh, KMU members and the BN members, sort of being held under ar- with heavily armed yeah. military police presence, just simply for trying to express their rights as full workers. Combat, full, full combat, combat yeah. Um, that it embarrassed Verizon. As you said, it became sort of an international incident, and it was a key. We talk about in CWA how it was a key part to ending that strike, and that strike resulted in a contract for Verizon that has now been extended for a second time. It was such a good contract, um, and Verizon was so embarrassed during that strike that they have willingly agreed to extend that contract twice now. So. So on one, it was good in that it resulted in a positive outcome for um, the the strike, um, the CWA members. But I think more importantly, when our CWA members came back from that visit, it just solidified them uh, and the, the, the sense of solidarity with their brothers and sisters in the Philippines because they came back and were just um, shocked that when they talked with you all, that that's a regular occurrence for workers in the Philippines trying to simply express yeah. themselves or stand up for their rights. You, you're right on that because uh, it, it's a common occurrence, uh, especially uh, even with the, the legitimate the issues that are being fought for by uh, the Filipino workers. But one of the uh, important lessons of this str- the joint struggle we have had is that the usually the big companies in the U.S. would uh, uh, situate their plants in countries that have low paying uh, rates in terms of wages. So the, when we study the situation, the for example, the workers in the Philippines under the Verizon would be t- uh, ten times less than what their uh, U.S. Uh, worker counterparts would receive here. So it's a learning lesson where. Uh, wages should be really uh, upgraded in this in this company, both here and in and the countries like like the Philippines. And indeed, it had uh, exposed not only the situation in the call centers in the Philippines, but as well as the the uh, the very dire conditions of uh, Filipino workers, like having low wages. The conditions at work are not really that ideal. Uh, in in so many companies, including the call centers, where during the pandemic uh, they are in a situation where they would borrow the headsets. <laughs> they not uh, having the their own headsets is really uh, a, a very dangerous uh, situation as the the pandemic is still uh, 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 the, uh, ongoing an ongoing thing at that time. So <laughs> it exposed a lot of things. And during the pandemic, too, wasn't it call center workers were forced to sleep in the call centers overnight in between shifts? They were forced to uh, report to work. Uh, they were, there are cases where uh, a, 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 you know, work at home is allowed, but this is our, these are just true for supervisory positions. The rank and file are, yeah, you're right on that. They are required to report for work and they're, uh, they're required to stay over uh, in their workplaces, uh, spending so much uh, time and uh, and uh, leaving their families behind. So it's 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 not it's a difficult uh, you know imposition on on workers of the call centers during the pandemic. So uh, work hasn't stopped in 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 many companies, especially the big ones, multinational corporations, where the production kept going on even if. Uh, the the pandemic is still there, and that they 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 are de- deprived the the freedom of uh, being with with their family at at a time where the uh, the situation is uh, is really difficult as we're under pandemic. 
Yeah, you know, um, as as we at CWA have really worked to really help educate our members about who sort of the real enemy is to their rights and their ability, um, to, their ability to to improve their conditions. Mm-hmm. What one of the problems we have here in the United States is the fact that the politicians and the corporations try to convince U.S. workers to view workers outside of the United States as the enemy, that they are, quote unquote, stealing their jobs. Uh, And they've been successful. Politicians like Donald Trump and others on the right want to demonize. And what we have really made an effort at doing is making our members see that the workers in the Philippines and outside the United States are just like them. Uh, and I think the partnership with KMU and our, our friendship has really provided an opportunity for U.S. workers. Um, you know, I was very moved in our visit in, in as one of our delegations in 2019 when we were stuck in Manila traffic. And it was a, a group of CWA call center members and a group of uh, Filipino call center workers represented by BN. Yeah. And they, you know, they just met each other and um, not quite sure how to relate to one another. And they overheard each other talking about uh, code names for abusive uh, callers. And they immediately bonded and connected over that sort of relationship. Um, And like, uh, so can you talk a little bit about some of the other um, sort of experiences that the Filipino workers are going through in the Philippines and and why U.S. workers should care about what's happening there, recognizing that we're all in the same fight together against the same corporations? Yeah, I think it, uh, what should be explained to our uh, counterpart in the uh, workers in the U.S. is that uh, it's really the culture of big companies to uh, go to low-paying uh, uh, countries in terms of wages, uh, uh, to seek uh, uh, lower wages, which translates to bigger profits. So uh, the observation that uh, Filipinos and other workers in the third world countries are uh, uh, grabbing the jobs of uh, the workers in the more advanced countries is not just uh, a, a, a cultural thing in the U.S., but it also happens in other advanced countries such as uh, uh, in Europe, uh, Japan, and other uh, uh, like countries. So it, it should be explained to uh, our co-workers that it's not a matter of us a Filipinos wanting to really g- grab the jobs from them but it's the imposition of this uh, of big companies that's prevailing in this in this uh, uh, in these relations so uh, international solidarity is really a very important uh, aspect of our lives as workers to really uh, exchange experiences and to understand more the situation where these things are being imposed in uh, in 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 uh, gaining more profit, so it it should be explained that in the labor capital relations, the capitalists wouldn't really uh, uh, stop the uh, infusion of more funds in its uh, constant capital, but then they can they can uh, you know uh, make the the part of the workers, which is the variable capital lesser and lesser so the competition goes on and so we are all victims of this kind of setup and this is where we should uh, 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 bound our strength our, our unities to struggle for better working conditions higher wages and and uh, the, the respect of the basic rights of workers so i think this our common agenda that we should work on uh, whether workers uh, are in the uh, more more uh, developed countries like U.S. and Europe, and and uh, the unity uh, with uh, us workers in a, a, a backward country like uh, like the Philippines. So uh, it should likewise be uh, explained and uh, an an educa- educational aspect to show them that the exodus of workers in a country like the Philippines is brought about by the lack of jobs, low paying uh, professions. And and the attacks of, uh, of uh, on the ranks of workers uh, pushes a big number of workers from the Philippines to leave the country, the massive exodus to seek more uh, greener pastures and uh, to to bring back 
remittances to their families in the Philippines. But in so doing, they, they fall prey to you know, scrupulous uh, uh, recruitment agencies like what we're having now in, uh, in the U.S. about the J-1 scandal where teachers are you know, uh, being brought in, in, in bunch in, in, in the U.S., but they're being paid much lower than the, than the wages that they were promised mm -hmm. before they leave the country. And so uh, it should be understandable to our co-workers in the U.S. that uh, we're both exploited in this situation. Uh, and you, we're, not, we're not in the process of really uh, you know, relegating them to lower, lower positions in their jobs, but then it should be, a, a, it should be seen as a forced... Uh, situation imposed upon us and that the solidarity should more um, um, should be strengthened more and more yeah I mean one of the things that we talk about in CWA is the fact that the major corporations international borders don't mean anything to them they are committed to you know working all around the globe and chasing as you said the lowest the lowest wages possible that they can find the CEO of um, GE Jack Welch used to say, that if he could, he'd build floating factories and put them out in the ocean where there are no laws at all. Um, and so, yeah, so it's it's important for the workers all around the world to recognize that and to work together to raise everyone's standards. But you talked about something that I think is really interesting um, about the teachers and the, you said J-1? J-1 visas. J-1 visas. As, we've, as CWA has been working closer with what's happening in the Philippines, it astounds me how few Americans recognize that the Philippines was a U.S. colony for a big chunk of its history. And a, a lot of the economy in the Philippines was set up on a colonial mindset of serving sort of the U.S. market. Um, and while a lot of people think of, like for us in the call centers, of the work being moved from a U.S. location to a call center in the Philippines, what we've seen in the term in terms of nurses being trained under U.S. medical standards in the Philippines right. to basically export cheap nursing labor to the United States. And now we're seeing with the teachers. Could you talk a little bit about sort of that, the exploitation of labor, of bringing those workers into the United States and why we should care about what's happening there? Yeah. Uh, in the past, we have a neo-colonial relationship with the U.S., uh, with the neo-colonists. But new colonization still exists till now, uh, meaning the uh, uh, imposition of uh, the policies of the U.S. still exists in the Philippines, like uh, trade liberalization, privatization, and the deregulation of the economy. We continue to uh, you export uh, raw materials, but we're the buyers of most of the finished products. From developed countries. So you're exporting, <laughs> you're exporting the raw materials that's being assembled, and you're then being. And then, but it. yeah, so that's that's the cycle, and uh, indeed the the situation back home is really dire in terms of the workers' uh, conditions with low wages, like uh, the equivalent of uh, eleven U.S. dollars a day is the, uh, you know, the the. Uh, Present the uh, highest minimum wage. We have a eleven dollars, eleven U.S. dollars a day. You've been paid by the hour here, but then they're back home. It's like uh, a day wage. So uh, that and uh, there is massive contractualization of labor. And this Can you explain what you mean when you say when you say contractualization, it means non the non regular workforce where. The um, the principal uh, employer is not obliged to you know to be accountable in terms of wages and benefits of uh, workers, but there's a third party that would assume responsibility, and it's a case of the principal employee washing their hands of not uh, paying uh, serious attention to the wages uh, and rights of workers. So it's a third party. It's the tantamount to the situation of the J-1 teachers where there are unscrupulous recruitment agencies that would bring them to the, the U.S. So that's the mm -hmm. same situation where the and principal... So those agencies are making money off of bringing... Yeah, them. and uh, for example, the recruiting 
uh, schools in in the US for example uh, do not answer to their responsibilities and accountability to their employer but it's the recruitment agency that would take care of these uh, things so it's that's that the same situation and the the increasing attacks o- on workers rights is really uh, a very uh, tremendous thing that's happening yeah kabon can you talk about that i mean we in the united states there's been a lot of attention and rightfully so to the 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 horrors of the duterte regime while he was president in his quote unquote war on drugs and and human rights violations um can you talk about how ingrained that sort of is in the Philippines that Duterte wasn't just a, a one-time occurrence and and what it's like today under Marcos Jr., the new president, what it's like for workers who are just trying to organize and, and stand up for themselves. I think the the uh, fact that the ICC has called on the Duterte regime. The International Criminal yeah, Court. The International Criminal Court, sorry, uh, called uh, Duterte's attention and that he is liable for the violation of of uh, human rights and this is an ongoing thing a uh, debate now and uh, that is uh, clearly it underscores the liability of uh, of uh, Duterte uh, of these killings whether they were drug related or or related to be, uh, to people who are critical of his government and indeed there were a lot of uh, of killings under his regime were most of the victims of, for example in his drug war were the poor people in the community so they weren't given their day in court and uh, uh, even if, if if they were involved in a very uh, petty uh, drug uh, case then the immediate solution of the third is to kill people and this has been a prevailing practice during his reign but then uh, sadly it has been carried over now by the uh, Uh, Marcos Jr. Uh, regime, and that the uh, execution still an ongoing thing called the extrajudicial killings. In fact, uh, we have uh, uh, filed a complaint with the uh, International Labor Organization in 20, uh, last year, where the number of people ki- uh, workers killed were 68, but then it has risen to 77 just recently. And when you talk about that, it, it... 77 people have been killed. That's uh, the labor sector. The, right, right. So those are just labor activists, yes, labor yes. leaders. Leaders and organizers. Organizers who have been... And maybe uh, advocates of uh, labor. And 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 how were... Was there a demonization of them? I mean, what has led to their killings? Yeah, I think that's an important question because indeed it, uh, what you said is true. Uh, it starts with vilification. Uh, it was... Uh, demonizing uh, a, a target and uh, the implementation of red tagging which is the modern version of mccarthyism if, uh, in the us so uh, when this this uh, uh, this uh, vilification is done the, the the next fearful thing is that you'd be arrested without undergoing due process uh, and that uh, you you're subject to warrantless arrest as this is one of the provisions so basically if i can go back for a second so they so basically they start by saying that you are a um Recru- communist terrorist recruiter you're or- a red tagger you're recruiting for an insurrection yeah um but who's doing it who is and where how is that information getting well out? this is uh, being uh, implemented uh, being done by the agency of government which is called the national task force to end local communist armed group uh, in in the cities or ntfl for short and that while uh, the marcos government uh, distances itself from being involved in this red tagging uh, activity of the ntfl cap it's it's a, it's a it's an agency of government it's being funded by congress and it's not being stopped in its in its attack on uh, workers uh, leaders and activists and other and doesn't quarters, the vice president of the Philippines Sarah Duterte she is part of she's part of that yeah. yeah and she's one of the red taggers she's secretary of uh, labor and she red tags teachers who merely uh, you know uh, ask for the 
uh, increase, for example, of wages and better work con working conditions. Last, uh, uh, last May, the teachers' representative in Congress, Franz Castro, uh, reiterated the teachers' demand for the uh, hiring of 30,000 teachers because of the exodus of so much number of teachers abroad. And it was branded by Sara Duterte as being Terroristic. <laughs> Just for wanting higher wages for teachers. Yeah, for higher wages and, and hiring. the hiring And hiring teachers. more teachers. Teachers is, is branded as a terroristic act by, by uh, Sarah. So you and I can laugh about like how ridiculous that sounds, but like that's actually dangerous. That's life threatening. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. So what happens? I mean, I know like people like, um, like our, our brother at CWA, Alex De La Rosa. Um, who was red tagged and uh, BN, you know, legitimate labor organization working to organize call center workers has been red tagged as a recruiter for the yeah. National People's Army, the NPA. Um, what what happens to these folks after they're red tagged? What what happens next is uh, you you you'll be uh, a candidate, for example, for warrantless arrest, for uh, kidnapping by by the police. Uh, Elements in the Philippines, as proven by the the uh, failed kidnapping of two organizers of uh, the teachers' organization and the health workers, Diane and Rian in Cebu City, where the police were involved in, uh, in their kidnappings, and uh, the uh, they were uh, released because there was this uh, guy who around who was able to to take uh, a video of the actual kidnapping, mm. and it was wrong timing because the the uh, ILO high level tripartite mission were were coming already in the in the uh Philippines so they were constrained to release the two guys and uh, it had they not been uh, uh released they would have been added statistics to the long list of uh, of uh, organizers and leaders of the labor movement uh who had been lost and not uh, located as, at this time and worse it would uh, mean uh, your death warrant if you're vilified and then eventually you're red tag. The next uh, thing is kidnapping or, or a case in court and, uh, and very more dangerously is the uh, killing of uh, those who are red tag, uh, as in the case of Alex Dolaroso, who was a mere uh, uh, organizer of Bien in Bacolod City. But, and shamelessly, the government said that in the ILO uh, conference that Alex case is a simple case of robbery. Uh, the government representative was mouthing the position of the police in in uh, Bacolod City that it's just a mere case of uh, of uh, you know robbery and yet Alex had been kept for three days and uh, when he was uh, uh, located he had 26 tab wounds. So it's really right. incredible. From a pickaxe, correct? From an uh, from a from nice a, from a, a knife. Knife. Yeah. So it's really you know incredible where government would deny the existence of such uh, attacks against uh, workers, workers' organizations, and the various sectors of society. So and there's little hope to go through the justice system when you've been red tagged, correct? Like Manny Asuncion, a labor leader, who they brought charges on 15 police officers. And I know those of us from the U.S. that were watching were hopeful that maybe there might finally be justice, but if the case yeah, it's, it's really, it's really, uh, it's really ironic. It's really incredible that the 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 filing of the charges against the fifteen uh, uh, police officers who were found to have been involved in the killing uh, of uh, Mani Asuncion were cases filed by the National Bureau of Investigation personnel themselves, who is a uh, which is an agency under the uh, Department of Justice, and uh, uh, we're really, uh, you know, strongly in revolt about the the you know uh, immediate dismissal of the case without really having any hearing uh, of it. So it's it's really a, a a questionable decision to just dismiss such a case where. It was agent the in the first place the agency of government national bureau of investigation just like the FBI would file the case against the fifteen police officers. So, can you talk, my brother, a little bit about 
how U.S. trade policy in particular can impact what hap- what's going on in the Philippines right now for workers. Yeah, uh, there's a, an important uh, program of the U.S. government that they, they call the uh, General uh, System of Preference and this GSP, uh, and this entails the export of uh, uh, various products to the U.S. market. And this is, uh, but there are important requirements like uh, the observance of the respect of labor rights and uh, human rights before the trade deal could be uh, could be implemented. So uh, we're calling on the U.S. government to stop the trade relations uh, while the the uh, Marcos government hasn't really uh, 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 come up with uh, concrete actions into uh, stopping all the attacks against uh, workers and citizens in the Philippines. So the high-level mission of the ILO have already underscored that these attacks are occurring. And the conclusions would show the the reality of the situation, like uh, they've observed that uh, these are long-standing cases of uh, of uh, being filed with the ILO. Second, the inclusion of the labor movement in the counterinsurgency program uh, uh, of the government is uh, a fixated thing in their minds. Third is the uh, uh, the intrusion of the police and military in purely labor activities. So uh, this situation is is clearly uh, underscored by the high-level mission uh, which happened in January. And indeed, the attacks are still an ongoing thing. And we want this uh, inhumane uh, uh, attacks uh, that are unleashed against workers to stop soon. So our government could say, we're not going to give you trade benefits unless you stop the persecution of human rights defenders in the country. We, we would be happy to hear that from the uh, U.S. government. Uh, so would we. strongly take uh, a strong position against these uh, attacks on our ranks. Good. Um, and U.S. taxpayers should be worried about where our tax dollars are going in terms of the repression of human rights activists, labor activists, environmental defenders, etc. in the Philippines, right? Yes, uh, there's a program which they call the Operation Eagle, and this is one of the programs being funded by your government through people's tax money, and that uh, this this uh, uh, money goes to the military, and yet it's not for the purpose of uh, uh, really uh, defending the country from external aggression, but it's being used to aggress uh, against the rights of uh, uh, the Filipino people, and so I think it's uh, it's uh, appropriate that the uh, U.S. Uh, citizens would really uh, would speak out and uh, and uh, ask accountability on where their money goes. I think this is an important uh, position to take and should be led by the trade union movement in the U.S. Uh, quite... I know the U.S. labor movements endorsed the Philippines Human Right Human Rights Act a PHRA um, in the U.S. Congress. Would that be helpful? Yes, uh, it will be helpful indeed if we, we take a strong position to for the passage of the Philippine Human Rights Act. And this will also entail uh, to the, the stoppage of funding of uh, the Philippine military and police, especially if they don't uh, get their acts uh, uh, straight uh, and that uh, it should really uh, come to a point where they would uh, uh, sincerely uh, commit not to do these uh, inhuman acts against against workers and people in, in the Philippines. So we are glad that this is this position is uh, strongly uh, endorsed by the trade union organizations in the U.S. and we uh, we acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, the uh, uh, the uh, AFL-CIO have taken cognizance of this strong and courageous position of the uh, labor movement against this uh, uh, harassment, intimidation, and killings. We're all united into the all Philippine trade unions, and this has uh, uh, brought us to a point where uh, I think the AFL would be 
giving out the George Mini Award for all uh, the trade unionists in in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, so I know um, we're running out of time. Uh, so I just one last question. We, the U.S. labor movement stands arm in arm with all of you in the Philippines. Um, your struggle is our struggle. But I have to tell you that we think it's hard here in the United States to organize, and it is. But you, my brother, and so many of your comrades and colleagues face actual death from what you're doing. What is it that keeps you fighting every day against some really difficult odds? Well, it's, I think, the unjust uh, situation that's prevailing in the Philippines that keeps us moving despite the threats uh, to life and limbs uh, of uh, the Filipino workers. And we're inspired with the, uh, the constant struggle of uh, our uh, common workers on the ground, despite the very difficult situation. In one case that we had, uh, the, uh, uh, our, our uh, affiliate at the uh, 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 Nestle company, uh, Wyatt Nestle, we call it, were uh, constantly being uh, intimidated to to disaffiliate from the KMU. And uh, day in and day out, they're being visited by the uh, elements of the ntfl CAC in their workplaces, in their houses. Uh, and it's a it's a matter of life and that situation. But then they were so courageous in, in uh, standing their ground, stay put, and they didn't sign the documents that the uh, that the um, uh, NTF L C A C uh, elements, especially those uh, who are with the military and police, to just have them sign the 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 uh, document that says that they are disaffiliating from the KMU. So uh, things like this are very inspiring and would always keep us very dedicated and in service of our members uh, and, and the, the Filipino people in general. It's indeed a very difficult situation where our lives uh, are in danger day in and day out. But then it is an inspiration for us to really work with the workers, not just to to have a a uh, good uh, uh, working uh, a good wages and working conditions, uh, but to our, our desire really to affect change in society. So trade unions are are models for uh, changing societies and did we will have to stand with this uh, task and uh, with the inspiration of uh, the courageous workers and the common uh, Filipinos uh, this will always keep us uh, struggling and moving forward for uh, a, 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 a genuine change in the in the setup of uh, our society in the Philippines. Well, just for myself, I just have to say thank you to you and the Filipino labor movement for being an inspiration and um, a source of strength for us here in the United States. And you know, long live international solidarity. And I wish my uh, to to express my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to for your and un unending support uh, in our uh, uh, daily struggles in the Philippines and. Uh, keeping abreast on the situation in the ground. We really appreciate your dedication into, you know, to uh, uniting uh, the American workers and helping us uh, getting out of this dire uh, situation in our country. Thank you very much to CWA. Thank you very much for the working people of the United States. Thank you, brother.